Now I am thrilled to introduce uh, Dr. Kim, Dr. Kim Steiner. He is a professor of forest biology and he's the director of the Arboretum. He will introduce today's speaker. Dr. Steiner. Normally on a day like this, at this time, I'd be blocked in my house because I couldn't get out on Route 322 because of a continuous line of traffic going somewhere, uh, mo mostly here, I think. Oh, boy, this is a rollicking place on a football Saturday morning. Um, but I got here, um, and I was asked to introduce our speaker. And I don't just want to introduce her, but I want to set the stage a little bit so you fully understand uh, the context for, for her talk. Um, you're probably vaguely familiar or maybe well familiar with the story of the American chestnut, which was one of the most common species in the eastern United States. Um, not, and not just common, but extremely important ecologically, economically, and culturally. Um, and it has succumbed almost completely to a disease introduced from Asia. Uh, beginning in the early part of the last century. And by mid-century, mid-20th century, it was virtually extinct in, in the forest. Uh, fairly early on, people recognized that uh, the solution to this problem, and it was, it was very much desired to have a solution to this problem. The solution had to involve breeding. Uh, a couple of breeding programs started in the 20s. Uh, one by the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station and one by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. They both ran for about 30 years before they sort of ground to a halt because they weren't getting anywhere. Uh, and that's the way things stood in the early 1970s when I was in graduate school studying this sort of thing. The conventional wisdom at that time was that it might be theoretically possible to bleed a blight-resistant American chestnut. It was, for all practical purposes, impossible. Uh, this changed beginning in the early 80s with a proposal for a new approach. The early programs were based on faulty assumptions. A new approach, and based on that new approach, uh, some university scientists and others uh, put together a nonprofit corporation called the American Chestnut Foundation to lead this effort. Uh, that began in 1983, and it's still it's still in progress. And what what I think is really remarkable about the story of TACF is that where uh, government organizations, public organizations, had failed, and uh, for-profit corporations weren't about to you know, do anything for the problem. Um, a little nonprofit, uh, with the help of many, many volunteers, which Sarah will talk about, has changed the equation entirely. Uh, that nonprofit has sort of snowballed and gathered collaboration from university scientists around the country, uh, agencies like the U.S. Forest Service, state agencies, and many, many very well-qualified volunteers, um, and is, um, I think it's on its way to success. But it's gonna be a long, hard slog, um, and uh, well, you've all heard of the whooping crane and the condor uh, rescues, um, maybe the pandas and, and other things. I will tell you that it's a fair statement there, that there is no more challenging and technically difficult rescue effort than is underway with the, Ameri with, the, uh, with the American chestnut. It is really, really difficult and time consuming. Penn State became involved with the program about 20 years ago. My efforts on the faculty, Dr. Larry Coons, Dr. Henry Gerhold, both of them retired, and Dr. John Carlson, still active on our faculty, have been uh, involved in various ways, and probably for, for about the last 15 years, have taken kind of a leadership role uh, with, with that effort. Um, Sarah Fitzsimmons uh, has been on the staff for the past 15 years, and it's fair to say that no one knows more about the nuts and bolts of what's going on with this 
rescue and breeding restoration effort than Sarah, uh, who coordinates restoration activities throughout the region uh, for the American Chestnut Foundation and, um, and actually coordinates many of the state breeding programs, which are a fundamental part of the, of the effort. Sarah has degrees from Drew University and Duke University, and I tell you, she is a joy to work with. She is a powerhouse. I think you'll enjoy her presentation much more than my introduction. So, Sarah. Thanks, Kim. I appreciate that. And uh, you didn't take my joke that um, I was born and raised in southern West Virginia. My family's still down there. And I always say that I, I lost my accent in a tragic move to New Jersey, um, where it's, it's, it didn't work out too well for me. So um, uh, as, a, as a result, I often talk fast. I drive a little too fast, um, that, that Jersey influence. But uh, as Kim said, I've been uh, here at Penn State since 2003, uh, working on our program to restore the American chestnut. And um, I don't often get to talk about eating chestnuts. And uh, so what you guys have in front of you, I hope you guys didn't fill up too much on breakfast. Chestnuts don't have a lot of calories. There's probably like five calories in each one of those chestnuts. So hope you guys have room for those. Um, people have been eating chestnuts uh, throughout the temperate region of the world for millennia. And um, as Kim said, the American chestnut was integral to the culture of the US uh, for many years until an Asiatic fungus came and virtually eliminated the species. So what I'm hoping is that in the next five, 10, 15 years, American chestnuts and other chestnuts will start to um, be much more commonplace in our produce sections of, of the U.S. Uh, through, through the work that we're doing. So as a bit of an introduction to that, I want to introduce you guys to eating chestnuts. How many of you guys have eaten a chestnut? Oh, a, a good, good number of you. All right, great. Well, so what you have in front of you are four different kinds. And um, they're color-coded, so uh, number one is, is white, number two is blue, number three is pink, number four is yellow. So I see some of you guys have already jostled those around a little bit, so maybe uh, uh, cheat from your neighbor to, to keep those straight. Um, what you also have in front of you, a free mood pencil. Very exciting. So the, the, uh, those green pencils change color as you hold them in their hand, they, they go to yellow. Uh, so those are free for you to take with you. Um, but uh, we, we just want to see what you guys think about these different types of chestnuts. And I'm not going to tell you what they are, uh, the different kinds, until you get a chance to sample them all. Um, but they are four different, very different kinds of chestnuts. Um, depending, on, depending on who you ask, there are seven to nine different chestnut species across the world. Um, here are, here's the, the U.S. species. There are three species in the U.S. Uh, there are two chinkapin species. Um, which I'm not going to get into too, too much, but if you look back at our, at our uh, booth back there, you'll see what the chinkapins look like. But Castania dentata, the American chestnut, uh, has a range that goes from Maine to Georgia, west into Indiana, and that's the primary species that we work with. Um, there's the European chestnut, Castania sativa. A lot of you may know it as the sweet chestnut. And then there are four Asiatic species. Uh, Castania crenata is the Japanese chestnut, and then there are three species in China. Um, a lot of you may have planted or seen Chinese chestnuts, and um, that's Castania melissima. That's probably the most common tree planted in the United States right now as far as chestnut goes. Um, if you have seen, say, the Dunstan chestnut in, in stores, or um, if you go to uh, the Game Commission, the Pennsylvania Com Game Commission sells uh, tree chestnut trees. Those are primarily Chinese chestnuts or Castania melissima. Uh, here's what the nuts look like, and again, I'm not going to tell you what's what, but the, 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 they can be fairly different. You can even see um, on your placemats that they, they're very different in size. Number four, that's really big. Um, that's cut in half. We only gave you one because they are so large. Um, but, and then number one is probably the smallest, um, and so we gave you both halves of those. But you can see the difference. Oh, I, we didn't have access to the largest nut. That's called Colossal. And they have um, jumbo sizes that can be, uh, maybe it's a little bit of an exaggeration to say that it's approaching the size of your fist, but they can grow very, very large. 
So, a little bit about the anatomy of a nut that you're about to eat. A lot of you may think, how in the world do I get into this thing? Um, so, uh, the outer shell, um, that's your, your, your shell, that's the pericarp. You want to take that off, and you can use your fingers to pull that off. Inside the hard shell is a rather bitter-tasting um, skin, and that's called the pellicle. And you can see that here in the picture right here. On some of those large ones, the, the largest nut, you'll see um, the pellicle gets folded into the nut meat. That's your cotyledon. That's what's gonna feed the tree as it germinates. And at the pointy end of the chestnut, you'll see a little embryo, and that's what forms the root right here and the subsequent tree. And then the, um, the star-shaped area, the light brown area, that's called the the hilum, you don't really need to know that, but just to give you a, a sense of geography of, of the nut. So you wanna try, uh, you may wanna ask a neighbor who has good fingernails um, to get the, the shell off and then shave off as much of that pellicle as you can. Um, try the pellicle if you want, but it is a little bit bitter. Um, but if you guys don't mind, you know, as, as we go through this talk, Try the different kinds. I'm gonna ask you to rank them there on that sheet in front of you. We're really curious to know what you think about those different kinds and what you think about the experience, texture, taste, flavor, the experience of opening the darn things. <laughs> um, it, it, this is the easy part though, I'll tell you that. So this is the hard part um, right here. That's, that's a burr. So we, <laughs> I've, I've heard them called tree urchins because they're so spiny and they're hard to get into. Um, I uh, try as, as hard as I can. We've, we've gone through, I don't know, Hoy, we went through about 15 different types of gloves <laughs> this, this fall, harvesting thousands and thousands of chestnuts. Um, so if, um, and again, if you want to get an experience of what that burr uh, feels like, um, we have some examples back there at the table. They're very spiny, very tough. Um, one of my first, I love flip-flops. That's like my favorite shoe to wear, and I learned really early on in this job, do not wear flip-flops in a chestnut orchard. <laughs> it's very, unless you, I don't know, unless you enjoy that kind of thing, but I. Um, so again, eating chestnuts has been a real integral part of the culture of many people throughout the, the temperate region. And you can see from this map uh, where the, the chestnut ranges really are of those uh, you know, seven to nine different species. Um, this is a picture that um, I took when we were in China. Uh, Kim and I and some other scientists, we went uh, to China to examine what uh, Castania melissima and the other two species did in the wild in China. And it was really incredible. We were there in September during harvest season and you could find chestnuts everywhere. It is such an integral part of the culture and the people and, and you just find people eating chestnuts all the time. This is a street vendor. Um, you can see he's got pebbles. There's actually a little bit of sugar uh, mixed in with those pebbles and he's roasting chestnuts. Um, and so while you guys may have heard the, the, the roasting chestnuts on open fire, I won't um, impose my singing ability upon you all today. But uh, so what you guys have are raw chestnuts. They have not been roasted. Um, when you roast them, they get a little bit of a nuttier flavor and the texture changes a little bit. Um, we have a few extra uh, left in the back. So if you really enjoyed the experience of eating them raw, please feel free to grab a handful, stick them in your pocket for uh, the rest of the game or the walk to the game, because it's 1.7 miles. Um, but, and then here's some people, um, uh, you know, again, we, almost everywhere we went along the roads, chestnuts were planted, people were collecting chestnuts left and right. This one woman, we were standing around with some of our colleagues there, and this woman just shimmied up a tree, shook it as hard as she could, and <laughs> then grabbed the chestnuts at, at the base and, and went along her way. Um, here are some pictures from the, the, the United States when chestnuts were at their height. In the late 1800s, early 1900s, um, this is a group of people collecting chestnuts in 1900 um, in, in Philadelphia, and you can see they're in there, some, some pretty nice clothes. And what's interesting is if you look at some um, New York Times articles from the late 1800s or early 1900s, there were articles describing uh, uh, the elite from New York City going to uh, Western Connecticut to go chestnutting. It was sort of a, an event to take part in. And um, so this is a group of us. We went uh, to Ohio about a month ago. And uh, you can still experience uh, collecting chestnuts 
um, from, from wild trees, especially in orchards that we're planting as part of our research. Um, and I just wanted to make that comparison of here's the small tree, it's been blighted, it will still fruit even though it's, it's diseased. Um, so that comparison of us being able to reach up and grab chestnuts versus this large tree over here in Fairmont Park, that's a pretty, that's a pretty big difference. So that's an etching from Fairmont Park out in Philadelphia of people, again, just at the base of this really humongous tree, uh, making a beautiful, lovely day, uh, collecting chestnuts at the base of this tree. Um, chestnut production in the US is 1% of worldwide production. So people eat lots and lots and lots of chestnuts. Um, people eat lots of chestnuts in the US, but most of them are not created in the US. Most of them are imported um, into the United States. So uh, the thinking is that there's a really great market for bringing chestnut to US consumers. Um, and you can see here, um, production has certainly increased. Um, Michigan is really leading the way. Uh, Michigan has a cooperative called Chestnut Growers Inc. where they're trying to really um, ramp up production and get chestnuts to the, to the US consumer. Um, uh, Florida has a lot of, of uh, farms. Ohio has a lot of farms. Um, again, if you go to the booth back there, you'll see uh, the Route 9 Cooperative in Eastern Ohio. They create a lot of different products like chestnut flour or dried chestnuts that you can use um, in cooking. And, and you may not know this, but chestnuts are gluten-free. And so you can use chestnuts to brew gluten-free beer. And that's what a lot of the chestnut, dried chestnut products are used for. So that's sort of my spiel while you guys about eating chestnuts. And, and again, this is, I hope this is sort of the introduction, one of the first times you guys can experience, of many, that you guys will experience eating chestnuts. Um, so the reason that we don't have chestnuts in the US, as Kim mentioned, is, is the chestnut blight. The chestnut blight is a fungal disease that was introduced into the United States, uh, most likely on Japanese chestnuts, actually, that were imported throughout the late 1800s and early 1900s. Um, the fungus is called Cryphonectria parasitica, um, or the chestnut bark disease. It's a girdling canker that spreads very quickly. Here you can see the map. Um, it was introduced into uh, the port cities, again, on Japanese chestnuts that were imported into New York City, into Philadelphia, and, and the fungus just spread very, very quickly. Um, uh, the American chestnut was very densely populated through its original range. You can see that green area. That's the original range of the American chestnut. Um, and because chestnut, in some cases, was one out of every four trees, the spores could just spread very, very rapidly. So by 1950, uh, the, the fungus had pretty much infected every tree on the landscape. Uh, it was um, uh, first identified in 1904 in New York City. Um, and so we usually say 1904, okay, that's, that's the first identified um, uh, location, even though it was noticed other places, people didn't know what it was. Uh, they finally figured out what it was. By about 1930, it had gone across all of Pennsylvania, and then again by 1950, it had pretty much reached the edge of the range. So what does the American chestnut look like? Um, as Kim said, it was a major component of the eastern forest. It grew very large. Here's a picture um, of a family. This is in uh, in the Smoky Mountains in, in Tennessee. Uh, the largest documented tree was 15 feet in diameter at breast height. So you can imagine that's larger than this stage, even um, as big as these trees could, could get. Here in Pennsylvania, uh, it was very plentiful. Um, it, it, it typically didn't reach uh, sizes of 15 feet in diameter, but usually maybe five to six feet in diameter, which is still a, a pretty large tree. Um, I like to show this map. So after the game, or during the game, if you can get internet access. Um, <laughs> uh, Google has uh, digitized the entire proceedings of the Pennsylvania Blight Commission. So the chestnut tree was so important to the economy of Pennsylvania that Governor John Tenor in, in the 19-teens set aside $250,000 for uh, to, to get scientists together and figure out how to stop the progression of the disease. And the entire proceedings from 1911 to 1914 are online. It's the proceedings of the Pennsylvania Chestnut Blight Commission. Um, and this map is derived from those data. And you can see how much lumber was coming out as the blight ravaged through the, the state. And so those, those blue and green counties are where chestnut was um, uh, 
highly densely populated. A lot of lumber was being taken out because the blight was coming through there. So you can see in some cases, 30, 40, 50% of the lumber that was coming out of those counties at that time was American chestnut. Um, and, and I like to show this map because it's sort of a, a corollary or an, an, an analogy of how prevalent American chestnut is in the wild. Now this isn't number of trees, this is percent of timber, but American chestnut tends to be most prevalent in Pennsylvania in those southeastern counties. You really find it along the Appalachian Trail, it's all over the place. Here in Center County, you hike up Mount Nittany, they're all over the place, um, up the mid-slope. And then in those northern tiers and western part of Pennsylvania, it's less prevalent, primarily due to different soil conditions. You can still find it, but it's not nearly as densely populated as in the central portion and southeastern part of the state. Uh, just a couple more pictures to show you how, how pretty cool this species is. Here is a person standing down at the base of a tree. I mean, you don't see a limb for almost 60 foot. And this is a real classic um, picture of what you want from a timber type tree. And so that's what was lost from this species. They call it a cradle to grave species. You could use it for cribs and coffins and everything in between. It was, it was so useful. Uh, the nuts are highly valuable for wildlife. You could use the tannins and tanning leather. Obviously, that's, that's now done by um, uh, chemical derivatives, uh, no longer extracted from the bark. The nuts were valuable to people and livestock, the cultural significance. Of course, chestnuts roasting on an open fire. I was looking at <laughs> some other songs, and there's a, there was a song book from 19, I think 1900 from Toledo, a song called Let's Go a Chestnutting. Um, <laughs> It's a rousing tune. Um, see if we can make that come back with, uh, I don't know, maybe Kendrick Lamar will do a, a version of that. Um, so there were early restoration attempts to bring back the tree. Like I said, the, uh, John Tenor set aside $250,000. The USDA got involved. They tried to replace it with the Chinese chestnut, Castania melissima. They tried backcrossing to Chinese. They tried cutting out all of the diseased um, uh, individuals and tried to stop the progression. And, and none of that worked, uh, or else I guess I wouldn't be up here today. <laughs> um, but. Uh, while the chestnut blight really infected every individual, um, it, the species is not threatened, endangered, or extinct. And that's because there's still a huge number of trees out there. What we call it is functionally extinct. So there's an estimated 430 million trees still out on the landscape. And you can see from this map the various densities. So up in here, Connecticut, Massachusetts, along the coast of Maine, uh, through uh, the, the Appalachian Mountains, there's tons of chestnuts all over the place. Um, but 84% of them are less than an inch in diameter. So what happens is the trees grow up, they get infected by the blight, they die back, they re-sprout, they get infected, they die back, they re-sprout, they get infected. And so if you hike Mount Nittany, if you hike the Appalachian Trail, if you go into people's backyards with a, a woodlot, most of the trees you find are gonna be heavily infected with blight. They're gonna be these stump clumps that don't produce chestnuts usually. You have to have some sort of intervention in order to get them to to fruit, and, and that's what we use in our programs to, to try and restore the tree. So how are we gonna restore the tree? How are we gonna get from you know, this, this, this gorgeous tree um, and, and take, take it here to modern times um, and, and get it to overcome the blight? So uh, the Chestnut Foundation and its many partners, uh, like Penn State and others, uh, we've undertaken a program called uh, Three Burr. It's a little dorky, but I think it's pretty easy to, to understand. So three Bs, breeding, biocontrol, and biotechnology, united for restoration. So a burr is what chestnuts come in. That's that spiny thing. So three B, U, R, um, those are the different techniques. So uh, breeding, of course, that's, and I'll show you some pictures of breeding, but that's a lot of what uh, Penn State has been involved in uh, to date. Biocontrol is trying to make the fungus sick and so everything gets sick, right? Everything gets infected by something. So the fungus can actually become infected by a virus. Um, so that's another avenue that we're trying to use. And then biotechnology. So biotechnology can encompass a lot of things. It can encompass molecular markers. It can encompass uh, genome sequencing um, that, that we've uh, also had here at Penn State. Uh, John Carlson's been helping do a lot of that. Uh, but then there's also genetic modification or, or transgenics. And, and that's been spearheaded at the University of Georgia and SUNY ESF um, up in Syracuse. So I showed you the different species of 
nuts, what they look like, here's the leaves, just to give you a quick indication. So your American is there on the left. It's a long, skinny leaf. It's a canoe shape, tapered on both ends, and it has a dentation that looks like a breaking ocean wave. That's your real classic American shape. Right beside it, to the right, is um, the Chinese chestnut. And that's, again, Castanea melissima. A lot of people have planted those. It's more of an oval shape. It's very shiny on the top. It has a lot of hairs on the underside, and it doesn't have that breaking ocean wave. Um, the other species are going to be less common. Uh, you have the European, the Japanese, and then up top is the Allegheny chinkapin, um, which typically isn't found um, north of, say, Harrisburg. Um, but that's more of a shrubby type species. Just to give you a real quick comparison, you can see how different um, the American is to the Chinese. Your American's typically going to be found on ridgetops and in mountains. Your Chinese chestnut is typically going to be found on farms and in, in shelter woods and things like that. Um, and then here's a quick look at the stems. Again, really different. Now, these, these trees read the book. They, they, they are doing what they're supposed to in the, the, the phenotypic um, uh, uh, exhibition. So the, the American chestnut has a thin stem that's red. The Chinese chestnut is, is sort of tan green um, with a lot of hair. So really different if you get the right um, elements. Um, what we have is a, what we call a tree locator program. If you think you find an American chestnut, we want to know about it. Um, we want to integrate it into our program for diversity. And so um, we have tree locator forms back there um, for you to, to put it in. And that's why I wanted to show you these pictures of what these things look like. If you think you found an American chestnut, send me a sample. Um, if, if it's not, if it's a Chinese chestnut, we'll, we'll let you know that too. So how do you find them? Um, so this is, this is a, a picture of a, on a foggy afternoon. I believe this is in Massachusetts. And you can see that center tree right there. So those are the male flowers of the, of the chestnut. So all chestnuts have male flowers like this. They look like long, fuzzy yellow pipe cleaners. And um, they come out in late May, or sorry, late June, early July. And that's really the best time to find these things, if they're flowering. Um, because that, that flower is so distinctive. It has a very unusual scent. Have any of you guys smelled chestnuts? If you've smelled them, you'll never forget it. Um, so late, late June, early July, um, those, those male flowers come out. But what we'd like you to do is, is uh, download an app on your smartphone called TreeSnap. Um, it's, it's free and you can get it on, on Apple or Android. Or um, grab some forms in the back if you're old school and, and, and document on, with pen and paper. And what you'll do is send us a sample of a tree along with information about it and we'll identify it. Um, it's kind of fun for me. Sometimes I think people just want to test me. I've had um, a lot of horse chestnuts, as you can imagine. So horse chestnuts are, are not chestnuts. They're actually in the Buckeye family. Uh, um, <laughs> so that's not what we want. Um, we want, uh, uh, I've also had uh, maples and beeches and someone, I don't know why. Again, I think it was just a test. They sent me pawpaws, um, which I love. I love pawpaws, but it doesn't look anything like a chestnut. Um, but so anyway, yeah, feel free, make it a game. I don't know, does Sarah know what she's talking about? Let's, let's, let's give it a go. Um, so the American Chestnut Foundation has been working with many, many partners and many volunteers, and um, that's why, it, to Kim's point, it's, it's really been um, such an interesting uh, model to look at. Um, there are orchards all over the place. There are over 500 locations. Um, throughout the eastern U.S. where people grow a lot of private individuals, a lot of universities, a lot of NGOs that are growing trees because it's such a huge project to restore a, a, a tree species. You need diversity, you need resistance, you need these things to be able to count, um, compete out in the woods. Over 500,000 trees have been planted with these volunteer and, and citizen science collaborators. And you can see um, a total of over 800 acres have been planted with, with these research chestnuts. I wanted to give you a close up. This is, um, I am right here taking this picture. I'm standing on top of a 16 foot ladder in Stone Valley. Do you guys know where Stone Valley is? Down the road, so that's, that's Penn State's research farm. So, or sorry, research forest. Um, so you can see the, the female flowers right here. There's kind of an assuming. They look like little green pineapples. You don't, you don't really think about trees having flowers, right? But, but, but they do. That's how the burrs form. So here's the females. And then here's the males back here, all showy and 
whatnot. Um, <laughs> but, but those are the males, again, um, coming out and, and producing the pollen. And, and you need two trees. In order to get chestnuts, you need two trees within about a quarter mile of each other. While they have both male and female flowers, they can't pollinate themselves. So you need to have two trees that can cross-pollinate so you can get chestnuts. So if you're thinking about planting chestnuts so you can get a bunch of them to eat, um, I would say plant five so you can get two <laughs> um, to go through and, and get chestnuts. Um, so then uh, once the burrs start to open, here's a picture of the, this is such a weird angle. Uh, there's your burr, the burrs will start to split open. Um, that's when you wanna go and grab the nuts out of there. Um, and that happens the last week of September, or first week of October, generally. If any of you guys park by Merkle Building, or out that way, Orchard Road, there's a bunch of Chinese chestnuts back there. I don't wanna give away our super secret spot for collecting Chinese chestnuts, but if you come to a game in you know, one of the early October games or late September games, um, you should be able to get in there and grab a few chestnuts and put them in your pocket for, for the game. Um, so these are the orchards uh, throughout Pennsylvania. Like I said, there's about 500 across the eastern U.S. There's over 100 of them in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. And I, uh, because we're at Penn State and because that's, that's where I work and because Penn State has really been a leader in, in this work, I wanted to focus on the orchards that, that we have. So you can see here in the center part of the state, there's a cluster of, of chestnut plantings and that's the research that we're doing here on Penn State lands. Um, while uh, my colleagues and I, we do work throughout the state and beyond, uh, we do work here on, on Penn State land too. One of the uh, initial plantings and one of the most exciting plantings is at the Arboretum at Penn State. It's not at the main, um, I, sorry Kim, I like to call it the pretty part of the Arboretum. <laughs> um, it's kind of behind, it's on uh, American Chestnut Lane. If you Google map it, you can see American Chestnut Lane. So it's back there, but we have um, 10 acres back there that we've been planting advanced back cross material to try and get blight resistant American chestnuts. Uh, we, when we're done, we will have planted over 250,000 chestnuts, um, of which we're gonna select 200. So we're planting a lot. Do you guys like bonfires? You can come. <laughs> um, we cut down a lot of trees and, and, and we burn them. Um, uh, we go through all the proper protocols just, just to let you guys know. Um, but um, you can see here, uh, I don't know if you guys can tell in this picture here on the left, there's a bunch of trees with pink down at the base. Those are non-selected trees. They don't have the resistance or they don't have the American form. Again, we cut out about 99% of the trees, throw them on a pile and burn them, have a weenie roast. Um, and then there on the right, you can see those trees. They, they have sort of a dark bottom. The, what we do is we take the blight and we put it in the tree. We take the fungus, we grow it on petri dishes and we stick it in the tree and we see if they're resistant or not. And so um, while we want that infection to be arrested, we, we want the tree to be able to seal up um, that infection really quick. So the ones on the right are, are uh, selections that we're using for um, further testing and then eventually restoration. Um, so until we can get the material that's highly blight resistant to go out in the woods, a lot of early trials were done. Uh, uh, Dr. Steiner started a lot of those in the late 90s, just using wild Americans. Um, wild Americans are great. They can, they can survive without getting infected for about eight to 15 years, depending on several different factors. So there are a lot of trials, silvicultural trials that were established in Stone Valley uh, with wild Americans. So we're following up on those, some of which have been in place for over 20 years. So we're getting a lot of really great information on how to get these things established in the woods once there's blight resistant material. We do a lot of work in the greenhouse. So if you guys live around State College and you wanna play around with chestnuts, uh, let me or Hoy there in the back know. We'd be really happy to have you help us uh, plant chestnuts, inoculate them, count them. What else do we do? Measure cankers. There's all kinds of wonderful quantitative work that we can get you um, doing here in the greenhouse. And then a really exciting thing that uh, Penn State's gonna be involved in next spring, uh, we're gonna be one of the first outplantings of uh, genetically modified trees. Um, the genetic modification, um, it's under really heavy, strict regulation right now. Um, have any of you guys filled out an APHIS application? 
I don't recommend it. Um, it's about 50 pages long and it basically says you want to make sure that you're not going to let this material get out into the wild and all that. You can't let transgenic material flower. Uh, you can't let, you, you have to give a report, a monthly report uh, to, to the regulators to ensure that that material is, is stuck in the place where it is and not, and not being removed in any way. Um, so under heavy permitting, this material will be trialed at Penn State, Virginia Tech, and SUNY ESF. Um, and, and be planted in a first landscape level trial. How does this material compete in the wild? How does it compete with um, traditional breeding material? How does it compete with wild American chestnuts? Um, so uh, Penn State will be really leading the way with that research. Um, and then finally, uh, we have a new endeavor. Like I said, we really wanna figure out how do we get um, the public, the consumer, excited about eating chestnuts and using it as a crop. And so uh, we're, we're exploring, we're uh, trying to learn from uh, locations that have chestnut cooperatives in Michigan and Ohio, um, uh, looking at the Center for Agroforestry in Missouri and seeing how we can get chestnuts more of a, of a, a, a commodity that people will eat on a more regular basis. So I have to show this picture. This is one of my favorite ones. This is Bob and Ann Leffel and Adam Carl. Um, uh, the, the, the work for chestnuts, while uh, institutions like Penn State and, and NGOs like the Nature Conservancy are all doing a really amazing amount of work, it's volunteers and citizen scientists. People like you who are interested in the project, planting trees in their backyard. Bob and Ann planted 700 trees in their backyard and their farm in 1994, and they really started this work. And this work wouldn't go on without the help of private individuals really finding trees, planting trees, doing outreach, giving talks like this. If you guys want, I have a thumb drive that you can take, get a copy of this presentation and go um, <laughs> spread the word about chestnut and chestnut restoration and research here. Um, but, but our citizen scientists do over 25,000 hours of, of volunteer work a year, which is pretty incredible. And a lot of people might ask, well, who cares? You know, the chestnut has been out of the consciousness, out of the landscape for over 100 years. You know, why should we bother with this? It's such a huge endeavor. It's, it's going to take a long time. It takes a lot of resources. Well, you know, now really is the time for conservation. We, we have the diversity still in the populations out in the landscape that we can utilize for diversification and for restoration. We need to conserve as much genetic complexity as possible. Um, and, and we really need to refine the methods of establishment. Um, I think one thing that, that a lot of people often overlook is the importance of native species and how important that is to, to the building blocks of an ecosystem. And as we lose other species, hemlock, ash, beech is under threat, you know, um, now we've got the spotted lanternfly. Um, there's a lot of really, <laughs> right, yeah, right? <laughs> um, there's a lot of things that are attacking our native species. And we hope that the American chestnut can serve, and, and the model of working with lots and lots of institutions and private citizens can serve as a model for um, helping conserve and restore um, other native trees that are so important to the foundation of our ecosystems. So what can you do? You can, you could, like I said, you can give this talk, you can plant stuff, you can make items like that bowl that uh, Jim Finley made, you can help out in orchard, or you can find trees. That's probably the easiest thing to do is just to go out on a hike, find trees, download tree snap, you know, collect the info, send me a sample. Um, even just that is gonna be a great way to get involved and get us information that'll help the, the progression of this research. Finally, where can you get chestnuts to plant or eat? I wanna give you guys a couple of, of, of buzzwords that you're gonna see. So you can get American chestnuts, wild American chestnuts do not have any blight resistance. Um, they can still be really fun to grow. They will get infected. They'll die back, they'll re-sprout. They'll die back, they'll re-sprout. Um, and there's a lot of examples where um, uh, those are planted. But most people want blight resistant trees. They want stuff that will survive the infection. So you're gonna see stuff on the market that says blight resistant or blight free. Blight free does not mean resistant. That just means that the tree hasn't got infected yet. Um, and those may perfectly be fine, but just as a, as a, as a warning, they're not blight resistant. Um, and, and most of the American chestnuts that you find um, commercially available are not blight resistant. They're, they're wild and they're great. And I recommend that you plant them, but, but don't expect them necessarily to have resistance. Um, Dunstan chestnuts, again, I want to mention that just because that they're really readily available. Um, you can get them at Walmart, you can get them at Home Depot. Um, they're typically, they're mostly Chinese. They're great for wildlife. They're really wonderful chestnuts. Um, but just to give you a sense of what those are. 
Um, if you want to eat them, there's Chestnut Growers, Inc. out of Michigan. There's the Route 9 Cooperative out of Ohio. And then the American Chestnut Foundation, of course, we um, have trees and um, specimens that you can plant either for research or for conservation of, of native germplasm. There are a couple of other places there. Badger Set Farms in Wisconsin. Uh, Chestnut Hill grows the Dunstans in Florida. Um, so with that, um, I will end it. Here's my contact info. I'm SFF3, Sarah Fern Fitzsimmons, the number three. I guess I'm the third SFF at pennstatepsu.edu. And there's our phone number here at the office uh, that you're welcome uh, to call. So with that, uh, do I have time for questions? Or? Yeah. Okay. We want to welcome our live stream audience and thank you for tuning in and we're going to say goodbye to you uh, until next time with Huddle with the Faculty and we're going to take some questions for Sarah now. Uh, if you have a question, just raise your hand and Lion Ambassadors will come and, uh, and find you. So. And so while we're taking questions and waiting for that one, uh, don't forget to eat your chestnuts and rank them to see what you think. Just fill out that uh, 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 little questionnaire there and take the pencil with you. Um, you might need it in line. I don't know. Um, do some doodling while you're waiting. But yeah, we'll take a question back there. Can you tell me how your, or oh, thank you. Can you tell me how your organization is going to avoid the label of trying to provide a genetically modified food crop when there's been such a backlash against it, those kinds of things. So, so the question, if I understand it, is how do you um, plant a tree that has a lot of backlash with, with genetic modification? Um, so that's a, that's a very good question. There's definitely backlash, and um, that's something that we're really um, uh, sensitive to. Um, right now, it's under really heavy permitting. It is not available for free release. Um, the, the material is, uh, there are applications right now under review with the USDA, the EPA, and the FDA in order to uh, provide uh, justification for allowing this material to be planted. Um, that won't change some, some of public opinion, which will stay staunchly anti-genetic modification. Um, and so while those applications are under review, and while it's still under heavy permitting, um, we're just going to work with uh, the public to, to get a lot of um, uh, input and, and ensure that the material is deployed in a sensitive fashion. Yes. Thank you, Sarah. This was interesting. Um, how long is it from planting until the tree produces chestnuts? A really good question. So um, when you plant chestnuts, if you want nut production, like I said, you, want, you need at least two living trees that are fruiting to cross-pollinate. Um, uh, you want them in full sunlight. So in full sunlight in an open field um, with good soil conditions, chestnuts can fruit in as little as three to five years. Some of them wait until five to 10, but so you're looking at about five years on average when you can get chestnut production, which is actually pretty good for nut trees. Um, you know, your oaks sometimes take as long as 20 plus years. So from a, a nut production standpoint, five years isn't, that's not too long. First question is, uh, behind the arboretum, can I pick up the chestnut? So behind the arboretum, can you pick up the chestnuts? Um, we'd rather you not, because that's stuff that we're using for research material. Um, if you want nuts for eating, though, um, we are working with uh, uh, materials that we could probably get to you through, through our work. Or like I said, those chestnuts at Merkel Building, they're free and open for you to collect from. And they're pretty easy to get to. And what I love about collecting at Merkel, um, uh, which is out on, on Orchard Road, if you get there about 7 a.m., 8 a.m., there's a community of people, primarily from uh, Italy, Germany, Spain, and then uh, China and Korea. And you can just go there and just really enjoy camaraderie of people enjoying picking up chestnuts. It's uh, actually a lot of fun. Yeah, second question is uh, how much good nutrition, I'm not sure. And uh, Another one, um, how we keep the chestnut very easy after three, four days buggy out, or how we uh, care about that? I'm sorry, I didn't catch the last part of that. Last question is, uh, after pick up three, four days, all buggy inside. Oh, the worms. How you, yeah. Ah, good question. So, so, okay, so a couple, couple parts of that. So um, chestnuts, when they fall, 
Um, okay, so there are two different species of chestnut weevils, and that's what makes the worms that gets into the chestnut. So um, while the chestnut is flowering and also uh, by the harvest, the weevils fly around, they're actually really cute, um, but they fly around and they deposit eggs into the nuts. As soon as the burrs open up and the nuts fall, those eggs um, signal to hatch and turn into the larvae that then tunnel through the nuts. Now, one of the reasons that we clipped open those nuts and inspected them all very carefully is to make sure that you don't have any worms in those. So I just want to make that clear. Um, if you did, extra protein. But um, <laughs> the best way is to harvest early and then um, treat the nuts in 120 degree Fahrenheit water for 20 minutes. And so we've actually done that with all of these nuts to ensure that the weevil isn't gonna get out. But you wanna harvest early, harvest directly from the tree if you can, and um, 120F for 20 minutes. To store them, you wanna refrigerate them. So um, most of the chestnuts that you see in supermarkets right now are just out in a basket or out on the floor of the produce section. And so as the, the season gets on, most of those nuts dry out because they're not under refrigeration. So what you wanna do is grab them, put them in a plastic bag and throw them in the crisper of your refrigerator and they'll stay good until about February, maybe even March. Um, before we get too far, I do, so have you, have you guys all tried what you're gonna try? Do you guys wanna know what you just ate? Okay, so. Um, number one is a hybrid from uh, our orchards at the Arboretum. Number two is a wild chestnut, and those are all collected at some trees that we have at Penn Nursery down 322. Number three is the Chinese chestnut, and those are from the Merkel building that we picked up. And then number four is the European, and that's what you typically get at the produce um, section of your supermarket. So, um, the, and the Europeans, you can see, they're, they're really, really huge, and most of those Europeans are actually bred with Japanese to create such a large chestnut. Okay, so there, there's your answers. One more yes, one more question. Actually, I have two questions. Uh, one of the problems in restoring forests is uh, the animals that live there, i.e. deer. And I wondered what their preference is for chestnuts versus oak and so oh, on. Oh man, it's it's like candy. They is love it, this stuff. I, yeah. I'm talking about the tree, not the fruit. Uh, both. Both. Yeah. yeah. Second question has to do with the furniture making quality of chestnuts. Straight grain, uh, and so on. And is this is this a, a, a really big market? I know there are a lot of older homes where the where a lot of the trim work is done in chestnut. Sure. So what is what's the future in that regard? Well, so, so the chestnut, um, what I like to say about chestnut is that it isn't the best at any one thing. Like it's not the best lumber that you can have or the best producer of, of timber, but it's really good at everything. So if you look at some of the old um, uh, furniture and things that were made, chestnut, and we have an example back there of a piano where the outer covering is not chestnut, it's mahogany or something or cherry or something that's fancier, but the chestnut was the interior because it's lightweight, easy to work, rot resistant. So um, it's incredibly useful for a lot of different things. I mean, obviously we hope that economically the timber will be a boon to Pennsylvania forests. We really think that as a hardwood species, this can really help supplement the oak that's already out there, the cherry and, and all that. And because it grows so much faster than oak, especially it can grow two times or more faster than oak, um, it can really supplement that market. So obviously, yes, we hope that it'll come back in a big way in that regard. Um, and then for deer, yeah, wow, that's a huge, huge issue. You, you, you can talk to a lot of people and figure out different ways to do that, but right now we fence them out primarily. Do we have time for one more or are we done? All right, one more. Yeah, 
So, so, so that's great. So, so to just real quick um, uh, repeat what he said, he's talking about a stand in uh, west of Portland, Maine. Um, actually, one of the best stands that I know of of American chestnuts that are naturally regenerating is in central Maine. It's not in Portland. It's about an hour south of Millinocket in a little town called Atkinson. Um, but if you let me know where that location is, we can get together with our Maine folks and figure that out. So the largest trees in the natural range are still about three feet in diameter, and they're not resistant. They're just lucky. They just haven't become infected for a lot of different reasons. But yeah, let's, let's figure out where that is and we'll, we'll get you an update on the status. Thank you guys, I really appreciate it. Go State.